the podium. I'd like uh, Richard, thanks for that introduction. Um, it's, it's good to be here in Santa Barbara. I've never been to California before. I apologize for the informality of my blue jeans, but I've United Airlines to thank for that. They, they sent my bags to, to Medford, Oregon. Um, and also I'd like to thank the Taubman Foundation for sponsoring uh, this event. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the kind of work that I do as a novelist, why I became one, and uh, the subject that I'm interested in and, and how I developed my interest in it. Um, I've published two novels, as Richard mentioned, The Lion Seeker and The Mandela Plot, but they're both really just one story. They tell the story of the Helga family, which is a fictional family um, that begins uh, in the 1920s and goes through all the way to the uh, almost contemporary times. Um, it begins with uh, immigration from a small village, Stettel, in Lithuania uh, to Johannesburg, in the, and uh, it ends with another immigration, this time from South Africa to the United States. So it's a, it's a story that's bracketed from immigration to immigration. And in that sense, uh, as well as many others, I think that it's a, a typically Jewish story. Um, and like my characters, I'm an immigrant myself. Uh, my father is an immigrant too. And his father, my grandfather, was as well. So that's three generations of us wandering the earth so far. And uh, the way things are going, sometimes I think you can't say with complete confidence that I won't, there won't be another immigration in our future. Um, it's interesting, now that both uh, books have been published, to, for me to look at different reactions, especially online, to what people think of the work. Uh, one, one typical reaction says, uh, the story of a Jewish South African was so intense that I think it might trigger a mood disorder. Um, perhaps strange to say, but I find that a reaction like that to be quite complimentary because it means that the work is more than a superficial distraction that it reaches deep into the reader. And that's the kind of thing that I try to accomplish with my work. When I was a kid growing up in South Africa, I used to uh, go into my parents' bedroom and my mother was a big book club reader. She had all these hardcover novels. A lot of them were popular fiction of the day, like uh, Sidney Sheldon or Harold Robbins. But there was also serious fiction, Nadine Gordimer, uh, E.M. Foster, uh, Doris Lessing, people like that. And uh, reading those books, at that time in South Africa, it was a very confined society. There wasn't, there wasn't a lot of access to, uh, to much television or much media from, out, from the outside world. So, so books were really an escape for me, a kind of um, a doorway to uh, intellectual freedom, freedom of the imagination. And what I loved best were the books that you, you read for hours and sort of lose yourself in and, and disappear into kind of trance. And you don't know how much time has passed until you look up and realize you've been reading for hours. And uh, I love those books so much that I wanted to, to write work like that, that would have that aesthetic objective. And uh, so I decided to become a writer, and I wanted to uh, study. I, I thought about the different options I had be, uh, at the end of high school. After, at the end of high school, my parents and I immigrated to Canada. And I th the natural sort of uh, choice would have been to study literature, I think, but uh, I had an alternative that I formulated. It was sort of my own little plan. I called the, the, the Hemingway plan because I was a fan of Ernest Hemingway's writing at that time, and I knew that he had not gone to college. Uh, instead, he worked as a newspaper reporter, and uh, he'd actually even worked for the Toronto Star, which was my new hometown uh, newspaper in Canada. Uh, he'd been one of the foreign correspondents writing for the weekly news magazine. Uh, the thing about being a reporter for Hemingway was that it gave him his subjects, whether it was expatriate cafe society in Paris or the bullfights in Seville, or war in the Italian Alps, Hemingway could not have found any of those things if he'd stayed home in Illinois and studied uh, literature. So I decided that I wanted to find my own stories out there to write about, and, and the way to do that was to become a reporter. So I enrolled in uh, a practical journalism program at a place called Ryerson, which is in downtown Toronto. It's a, become a university, but at that time it was called uh, something called a, a Polytechnical Institute. So it was very 
heavily weighted towards technical prowess and not much theory, which suited me just fine because uh, that's what I wanted. I wanted to learn the craft of uh, writing saleable prose. Um, and the instructors were sort of grizzled old journalism veterans who, who spent a lot of time in a pub drinking and smoking. Um, and after I graduated, uh, I, I sort of anticipated becoming a foreign correspondent, but uh, there was a recession on and there were no job offers of any kind. And I ended up becoming, um, working at a daily newspaper in, in rural Ontario with a population of around 10,000. So I, I didn't write about expat cafe society or bullfights. What I was writing about were uh, ice fishing tournaments, uh, fiddle festivals, junior hockey championships. That, that was a tough one because I didn't know the rules of ice hockey. I still don't. So, but whenever I had a spare time, I was writing uh, short stories and sending them to literary magazines. And it was apprentice work, and it was re rightly rejected, but it was gradually teaching myself uh, the art of, of writing fiction and working towards discovering a, a voice, which, uh, which is obviously the most important thing uh, in fiction, the point of view or the voice of the, the author. Um, there was one source of potential excitement in our coverage area, and that was a large military base. So this is back in the, in the, in the mid-90s, which uh, I would imagine most of the audience here today is probably too young to recall, but there was a civil war in Yugoslavia. The, former, the, the country of Yugoslavia had dissolved into separate parts, and there was a war raging. And what happened was um, the Canadians sent peacekeepers into that a war zone to try to keep... Uh, to keep the peace between the different sides. And so I convinced my editor to, um, to send me over there to report on the, uh, the fate of the Canadian soldiers, their, what their lives were like. Uh, and he agreed because he thought it would, it would be good for the families, to, um, the families of the soldiers back home to read about their, their loved ones. So I flew over there and I settled in to a base in an area called the Bihaj, where the fighting had been quite severe. Um, it was then under the control of uh, the Bosniak army, which, uh, which is uh, the military that was mostly Muslim, you could say, um, fighting against uh, the Serbians from the east and Croatians from the west. And what I was doing every day was I was driving around in armored personnel carriers with a little Pentax camera shooting whatever I came across, um, destroyed villages, refugees on the road, things like that. And I would file my stories back. And then one day the commander called me in. And he said, Ken, we have a, a problem, which is not, you know, you don't really want to hear that in a war zone. And he told me that um, the Bosnian troops had taken note of my presence. At that time, I should say, I had very long hair, and I, and I was wearing it tied back. And um, he said that they believed I was a Serbian and that I was also a spy and that they wanted uh, my passport and they wanted to interview me. So what I said to him is that I'm not a spy, I'm a journalist and I'm not giving anyone my passport, and we had a little bit of an argument. And I remember the commander kept asking me what my background was, as if I was hiding something. And I kept saying, well, I'm Canadian, that's all, and that should be enough. But of course, that was not what he was asking. Uh, it was not enough. In the end, uh, I had to discuss my ethnicity to assure him that I was not a Serbian and that I had no familial connection with, uh, with Serbia. So. I felt a little bit unsafe, and the, the assignment was towards the end of it anyway, so I cut, I cut it short and came back to Canada. But uh, in a way, I'd, had, I'd last had my Hemingway moment. I had something to write about, and I wrote a, a short novel, a novella, set in Bosnia called Peacekeepers, and it was published in McSweeney's, which is a somewhat uh, eccentric but well-regarded literary magazine actually based here on the West Coast. Um, it was good to be able to transmute those experiences into successful work of the imagination. But I knew somehow that the war itself wasn't the primary story. The real story had been my face. It was that commander asking me, who are you? What are you really? And I realized that my nose, my hair, my eyes, my type was recognizable in that Eastern European context. And I began to reflect more deeply on my ancestors, the people who had made me who I am. I was born in Johannesburg, which is Africa's most developed uh, metropolis with a population of around 10 million people. It's uh, a little bit of trivia. It's the largest city on Earth that's nowhere near water. It's not on a major waterway or a lake or 
doesn't have any access to the ocean. It wouldn't exist at all, but for the fact that there are currents of veins of gold running under the city, or, or were up until they were mined out, the world's deepest mines are. Johannesburg is basically a, a one huge mine town. Um, and I grew up in a suburb called Greenside, uh, just an ordinary suburban home, much like the ones all my friends lived in. But there was one important difference. My family included my father's mother, my grandmother, my Bobby. She was, that's a, the Yiddish term for, for grandmother. She was my father's mother, and what he'd done is he'd he built a small a room on the side of the house where she could live. So when I grew up, she, she had moved in right after my grandfather passed away. So uh, for my entire life, she was part of our family, and she didn't speak any English. She only spoke uh, Yiddish, so I, I learned to understand the language and to speak it a little. It was just part of the environment. Um, she'd been born in the year 1901 in a tiny village, uh, called Desat in northeast Lithuania. Uh, if you look on a modern map today, you'll see it. Uh, it's called Desetos, which is a Lithuanian name. The, the Yiddish is Desat. When she left that village, she, she sailed to South Africa. She was a woman already approaching about 30, and she had two kids with her who were my uncles. Um, her husband, Koppel is my namesake, so Kenneth Koppel, it's a... Uh, an, uh, analogous. Um, he, he came to South Africa um, first and then he sent money back to bring her. Uh, in the first years of Johannesburg, he was, he was extremely poor and the family, my father told me that uh, he used to sleep on the rolls of leather that were made for, uh, used for making shoes because they couldn't afford to buy a bed for him. Uh, but when I was growing up in Greenside in the 1980s, she, Bobby was the woman who would send me off to school. She'd be there when I came home. She would uh, cook uh, lunches for me, you know, latkes and uh, cinnamon and sugar was her big, big uh, speciality. Um, but she spoke mostly Yiddish, and what she talked about was a past that clearly was not past for her, uh, but seemed to be very much alive. Even in her 80s, after half a century of living in South Africa, she was still calling Desat Ahem, her home. And she would talk to me about this place where the lake froze and the horses raced on the ice, where the forests were covered in snow. And to me, sitting there under the hot African sun, on days much like this one, uh, Dusat seemed almost entirely unreal. It was mythical to me, a kind of fairy tale, uh, a figment of my grandmother's elderly, deteriorating mind. But then years later, when I was back from Bosnia, I had the picture of the real Eastern Europe, and I knew what a real war had looked like, the smashed villages, the tanks on those mountain roads, the old peasant women with their kerchiefs, and who had looked a lot like my Bobby themselves. And I knew that she had lived through the First World War in Desat, and, and that's what it probably would have looked like to her. And I began to understand in a visceral way that what she was talking about was not a fairy tale at all. It was a real place with real people, and it had contained people like me, who looked like me with the same fears and hopes, the same dreams and emotions. And it, it, it wasn't a a black and white photo, but a full color experience. And my grandmother died in 1993, a few years before I went to Bosnia. Uh, and after she was gone, I realized how uh, lucky I had been exposed to her as a, as a living connection to that to a Yiddish world that the uh, Holocaust has all but erased from history. So I began to research the reality of where my grandmother came from and therefore of my own roots. I learned that Jews had lived in Lithuania for almost a thousand years, and that Lithuania had particular importance in the unfolding of the Holocaust. Um, so j just briefly, uh, Lithuania was actually sort of the testing ground for the, the final solution. The Nazi leadership didn't really know um, if they could get away with, with committing genocide in an occupied country without engendering resistance in the local population. So in Lithuania in the summer of 1941, it was sort of their testing ground to see what would happen. Um, and there they discovered that um, not only was there no resistance to, uh, to, the, to, to killing the Jews, but there was actually enthusiastic cooperation from Lithuanians to such an extent that Lithuanians had even begun uh, murdering the Jewish population before the invading German military took power. Um, Unfortunately, in Lithuania today, many of those who committed the murders are uh, 
still revered as national heroes because they're seen as resistors to the Soviet occupation. Um, and the Jews in my grandmother's little village, uh, everyone, men, w men, women, and children, uh, including many of her sisters, my great aunts, were all killed on August the 26th, 1941. They got marched into the forest and shot, and their bodies were dumped into a pit. Um, and this was done everywhere in Lithuania in a process that was meticulously documented uh, in a memo called the Jaeger Report, which is an important piece of evidence that turned up uh, after the war. Parts of this report are reproduced in my first novel. The, so there were about 220,000 Jews in Lithuania in the summer, like June of 1941, and by the winter, so a few months later, they're all gone except for a few thousand who were uh, to, penned up into ghettos to be used as uh, slave labor. If my grandparents hadn't made the decision to leave Dissat in the 1920s, they would have almost certainly been killed, and I would never have been born, so I owe my uh, life to their bold decision to leave for South Africa. After the war, Dissat uh, fell behind the Iron Curtain of the Soviet occupation, and so obviously was in inaccessible to my grandmother in terms of any information getting, getting out, let alone uh, traveling. Um, so the only dissat that existed was the one in her imagination. And then that mythical frozen place became mine too, uh, gifted to me by her stories. So during the same time while I was doing research back into my family's past, I had also started to write a, a different kind of fiction. Uh, for the first time, I wrote a story set in Johannesburg about a Jewish family leaving for Canada. It was a, a tough unvarnished story full of slang, showing things as I remembered them and not as I might have wished them to be. And to my surprise, it was accepted uh, for publication right away and went on to be shortlisted for a prestigious award. So I was beginning to see the value in writing about my, uh, writing about the people that I come from. And so then I began to write about Dissat, uh, this, this village. And at first it was really just me thinking that I'd like to give these people a sort of second life in literature so that they bring them back into existence in some way um, to recreate them in language. Uh, but the more I wrote about them, the more I began to, and imaginatively into their lives, the more I began to see that what a strange and powerful experience it would have been for them to leave Lithuania and to travel all the way down to the bottom of the African continent to try to start a new life there. These Lithuanian Jews were Yiddish speakers steeped in an ancient way of life that went back for unbroken generations. What would Africa have looked like to them? It made me think of my grandmother in a whole new context, imagining her as a young woman sailing into Cape Town Harbor, not, not knowing what to expect, never having seen, for example, a, a black person or a lion or an elephant or the, or the bush felt. And suddenly I knew that the story I wanted to tell was the story of that immigration that new life in Africa. And so that became the focus of this novel uh, that I ultimately ended up finishing and, and called it the, the Lion Seeker. So the Lion Seeker is about Lithuanian Jews moving to South Africa and what happens to them there. Um, one of the things I tried to show was the excitement that could grip these little villages when an immigrant to South Africa would return, uh, telling stories of how fortunes had been made in, in the gold fields uh, wearing new expensive garments um, and describing, for example, the ostrich feather trade or the different businesses that supported the mining uh, concerns and, and how the opportunities, and more, most importantly, that, that Jews there enjoyed the same legal status as any other white person. So um, I wanted to describe also the sheer essential impact of the land as I imagined it. Um, so I thought what I would do is just read a, a short passage from the novel to give you an idea of what I, what I mean. Um, and this is uh, a main character, Gitala Helga, arriving in Cape Town. It reads as follows. Cape Town was on a bay raked by salt winds, its streets laced over the roots of a flathead mountain. Colors burnt the air, blood flowers, thorny eruptions of vermilion, lime yellow smears on the rocks like veins of fresh paint. The red sun had sandpaper beams. She saw human beings burnt the color of coal or dark brewed tea or cured leather. She smelled their alien sweat and their tangy cooking, 
heard the mad bibbering of their manifold tongues, a strange music that made her heart sag in the fear of this shattering place. But later she saw pretty whitewashed houses in a row near the waterfront, with palm trees in tranquil garden squares, and she dared hope that Abel had secured them similar lodgings. Johannesburg was two hot, dry days to the north by train, through country that stunned her like a blow, the cactus hills, the khaki desolation of the plains, the distant hazy sky pierced by that red sun, a madman's glowering eyeball. So that was Gittler uh, arriving in, in Cape Town from Lithuania and the sort of effect of the landscape on her thinking. Uh, the writing of The Lion Seeker also led me deeper into a better understanding of South Africa's Jewish community. Um, even at its height, there were never more than about 120,000 Jews in South Africa, but they were an extremely successful community, always at the epicenter of major events, political, economic, cultural. Right from the start, many of the entrepreneurs who developed the gold and diamond fields were Jewish companies like De Beers. Um, for many Jewish families, in the, in the small Lithuanian villages, especially around Ponovos and Kovno, South Africa became the literal golden land rather than the USA. Um, so as I described in, in the case in my family, uh, family members would go to South Africa, send back funds to bring the rest of their family. Um, and the result is that it, South Africa's Jewish community is an unusually homogenous one. Almost everyone comes from Lithuania except for a small contingent of German Jews who fled after, uh, right before the Second World War. Um, I mentioned that in South Africa, Jews were considered to be white, which is an important uh, point because it, they had the, the same status uh, in the political and, and social pecking order that w as other white people, meaning above people of color. Um, and this is unlike Lithuania where they were able to own property in South Africa. They could vote. They could live wherever they liked. Uh, but that also didn't mean that there wasn't anti-Semitism or that Jews didn't view themselves as beleaguered in some sense. Uh, there was a great deal of anti-Semitism, especially in the 1930s, in, in that sort of global rising tide of anti-Semitism in the run-up to the Second World War. Um, and uh, in the foreground, the novel was built mostly out of family stories, so out of memories of listening to my uncles. My uncles would visit my grandmother and sit around the table on a Sunday afternoon and uh, tell stories, and both of them were high school dropouts. They had gone into the uh, into the auto trade, and it was a, a sort of tough world, very full of rust and grease. They were sort of raised on the inner city streets in Johannesburg, and the Lion Seeker's main character is very much in that vein, uh, a very tough, uh, sort of uneducated, uh, in some ways brutal character. Um, and he works his way up to being a, a panel beater, which is a, a body shop worker, you would say, in the States, someone who fig who who knocks the dents out of uh, cars that have been damaged in accidents. Um, but he never forgets the shtetl that he was born in and the family members that are still left behind. And uh, much of the plot of the novel revolves around him trying to uh, buy a house for his mother and her wishes to bring the family over from Lithuania before the war, uh, before the, 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 the war begins and their fate is sealed. So The Lion Seek was published in uh, 2013. Uh, my second novel, The Mandela Plot, just came out last year. Um, and in this novel, what I've done is continued and completed the story of the Halga family. Uh, I trace the destiny of the family into the next generation um, with Isaac's son, Martin Halga. Um, when I wrote The Mandela Plot, I wanted to try something different, uh, a novel that was technically different from the, the narrative methods that I used in The Lion Seeker. That is to say, I didn't want to write another multi-character epic with a, told in the third person with a sort of poetic and detached voice. I wanted to write a novel that was more urgent and frantic in tone, uh, the kind of book that would grab the reader, reader by the lapels and shake them as it told its story. I wanted it to be a voice novel, meaning uh, in the first person, and I knew that the, the slang of my youth growing up in 1980s Johannesburg was something that I hadn't seen captured in literature before in a way I thought it could be. Uh, and sort of like uh, American examples, that would be The Catcher in the Rye or Huckleberry Finn or uh, those sort of adolescent voice novels that 
in which you learn about the, the character's fate as, you, uh, as, they are, as they are learning. You learn about their lives as they are only discovering their adult lives. Um, so where the Lion Seek was built out of historical research and family stories, the Mandela plot um, was almost all personal experience uh, growing up in Johannesburg in the 80s. So it's a, an autobiographical book in that sense, but the way I think of an auto, autobiographical novel is that um, the facts of the biography are just like clay and that you're molding them to, to, to form a finished artifact. Uh, in this case, the wider story of the Helga family with its, uh, with its many different concerns sort of transformed by the imagination. Martin Helga is a, is a teenager through most of the book, and as he speaks directly to the reader, um, we, we, uh, I, we have a, a cor I have a choral uh, accompaniment here. Yeah. Um, we have to, to learn along with him. And one of the important goals of the book that I had was to, was to recreate the emotional truth of what it's like to live through a complete uh, revolution. Um, so I should just to describe what apartheid South Africa was like uh, briefly. I, again, I guess a, a lot of you are probably not old enough to, to remember those days, but South Africa was, was a country ruled by the white minority. So that means there were about 30 million people in South Africa, um, and about 3 million of them, the white, po the white portion of the population, uh, was in absolute control. Uh, black people were not allowed to vote. They had to live in impoverished areas while whites lived in uh, relative prosperity. And the, the important point is that the government taught white population to fear black people. They taught that the imprisoned leader, Nelson Mandela, was a, a dangerous terrorist whose objective was the murder of, of all whites, essentially. Um, and this was hammered into the population with relentless propaganda, especially on the single state television channel. Um, conflicting views were repressed with censorship. People were imprisoned without trial uh, for voicing opposition to the government. The state used torture and assassination. State propaganda was also drilled into uh, kids like myself at school and, in, and also in the army, uh, which all young white males had to serve in for two years. It's important to understand that South Africa was almost completely sealed off from the world. It had its own strange internal reality at that time. <laughs> Uh, I like to think of it as us living in a, in a bubble in which the political clock had stopped in colonial times. To go from all that to a complete reversal of values is shocking enough, but for it to happen unexpectedly, suddenly, with a single announcement out of the blue, was earth-shattering to everyone in the country. And that's what took place in February of 1990. That's when the state president at the time, uh, Mr. F.W. de Klerk, he was sort of expected to be just like every other president or prime minister before him. He was a conservative white Afrikaner, uh, but he stood up in parliament and announced that he had decided to release Nelson Mandela and to hold full non-racial elections for all South Africans. So to put that in context, for, for, uh, to, to understand what the impact of that was like, I would suggest it's sort of like as if the Pope had stood up in the Vatican and said, uh, everything that the church believes in is, is, is in fact completely wrong and the Bible needs to be rewritten. It was that kind of, it was, it was that shocking. At least uh, it was to me and I would imagine to, to many parts of the white population. As I've said in, in the Mandela plot, I'm trying to capture that surreal feeling of spiritual and psychological dislocation that accompanies living through a total revolution. When everything you've been taught uh, is revealed to be a lie, how can you ever trust what you are told? You learn that reality is not what it seems, that it's all a kind of illusion that can disperse in an instant. You lose your sense of security, and you learn not to trust in what your society believes in at the present. So it sort of makes you into a, uh, a perpetual skeptic, uh, a contrarian, f uh, forever suspicious of patriotic uh, notions. Um, nowadays, any older white South African you talk to says they were always opposed to apartheid and that its passing was inevitable, but that is not my memory of what it was like. Most of us were brainwashed to believe in the state and to believe that the state would always endure, that what it was doing was both necessary and justified. Um, I think of the Mandela plot as a blend of realism and 
near fantasy, or rather it is realism taken to the edge of fantasy, to that overwhelming place where the impossible begins to realistically take place. So the intended effect on the reader is, is to be the same as living through a revolution in real life. The narrative is meant to mirror that peculiar mental state uh, with a story that becomes increasingly surreal because that's what the reality was like in South Africa. It's a, it's a history full of the impossible coming true. The story starts off in the Mandela plot with Martin Helga growing up in the suburb of Greenside in Johannesburg. He's living in the house that Isaac purchased in the first book, which was very important to, the, to that novel, both symbolically and as a centerpiece of the story. Isaac's struggle in The Lion Seeker was the classic immigrant struggle to secure a place in the new world, um, to fulfill his mother's wish of uh, a safe and permanent home. But the cruel irony in that book was that in order to to gain the uh, to, to to gain that house for his mother, Isaac ends up um, committing the one sin that forever alienates him from his mother. And the greater family irony is that although Isaac wanted to create a, a haven from the hardships of his own life and to ensure that his sons could have an easy uh, sheltered existence, the world was anything but uh, sheltered. Because Martin grows up in a safe garden surrounded by high walls, but like the country itself, he is living in a deluded state of isolation. Um, and then a, a young American woman arrives who is a teacher boarding at the Helga home, and she's teaching uh, kids in the uh, townships, townships being the segregated area reserved for black people. Um, but she's actually pretending to be a teacher and uh, is in truth a revolutionary who is carrying contraband to aid the underground struggle against apartheid. She takes Martin into the township and opens his eyes to what is really going on in the country. He sees the brutal injustice needed to maintain white dominance and the precariousness of the status quo. Uh, it basically shatters his whole world and after that he can never go back to hiding in his father's garden. He is seduced both physically and morally by this American visitor and drawn into helping with the freedom struggle despite his qualms about some of its methods. Um, and this in turn brings him into contact with the villainous uh, police captain named Oberholzer, who it's gradually revealed is the son of a, of a different Oberholzer who appears in the first novel. Um, and this Oberholzer Jr. enacts a brutal vendetta which has disastrous consequences for the Helga's last days in Africa. Um, so in this way, the book dramatizes my own fascination with, with how certain patterns repeat themselves in history in, within a family and within a nation. Uh, there's a sense that the past is something that cannot be broken from, uh, that the same drama is doomed to be acted out just with different players in every generation. Um, and inc interestingly, I think it's the act of immigration that is posited as a kind of antidote to breaking this repeated cycle. Um, it's a sort of spiritual as well as physical escape. Uh, and yet that escape could be viewed as an illusion because the Mandela plot is very much a book about angry politics, about terrorism, about race, about a nation brutally divided. Yet the America of today, the country that Martin escapes to, is also full of these same seething elements. So this book is therefore in a sense also about how we live right now and here as much as, as it is about apartheid, uh, South Africa of the 1980s. Um, in the Mandela plot, I try to find a method to bring all the wider forces at play at that time in the country into Martin's narrative. Um, th there were a lot of things happening. There was a, an underground war against apartheid, but there was also more conventional wars on the, on the country's borders um, being fought against Cuban and Angolan troops. Uh, for example, uh, there, were, there were major battles being conducted between South African forces and Cuban forces where Fidel Castro was actually calling the shots from via phone link from Havana. There were sanctions against South Africa and the worldwide cultural movement to put an end to apartheid and there were the issues unique to the Jewish community. Um, it was Philip Roth character said in, in his novel The Plot Against America that history is not something that happens out there. It's also what happens right here in your own living room. And I wanted to show that with Martin's life, that history is always personal, that all of these different strands do have a, an impact on one person's life. And in the end, that's what's most important about them, how they affect uh, individuals.
For example, just as I got my draft papers when I was 16 telling me that I had to report uh, into the South African, uh, to the South African Defense Force, uh, whether I liked it or not, so does Martin. I avoided that fate because I was lucky enough to be able to leave the country with my parents in search of a better life in Canada. But Martin has more difficult struggles. Uh, the novel uses a technique pioneered by Dostoevsky, in which, which some critics have called polyphonic, in which characters will sort of launch into these miniature narratives within the story, sort of uh, miniature first-person stories within the larger first-person tale of Martin's. And in this way, we get uh, an insight into how the political system affected all levels of society, how apartheid spread its poison through schools and families and institutions. Martin attends an elite uh, Jewish private school, but even there the school's values are enforced with violence. There's a scene in the book where the boys turn the Hagba ritual. So Hagba is a, is a ritual in, the, in a Jewish synagogue where the Torah scrolls are raised overhead. Um, and in, 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 the, in this school, that ritual is turned into a kind of athletic contest in which, the, which determines who the strongest kid is. And in, it, it's kind of a symbol of how in that environment, Torah values of justice and community have been replaced with what I would call more Greco-Roman values of being tough and powerful and dominant. And the school itself is sealed away behind high-tech security walls and armed guards with machine guns. And I think this is really one of the major themes in all of my work, uh, the, the struggle for justice balanced against the need to survive in a very brutal world and how characters manage that. Uh, as a writer, I don't really set out to create symbols like the lifting of the Torah and the Mandela plot, but there's a mystery to the process of writing that involves the unconscious mind. And if you're in tune with it, I think these kinds of buried meanings uh, will organically emerge. Writing novels is therefore a process of discovery, both of self-discovery and of gaining insight into the world. Um, and I think if they're done truthfully, they can be useful to readers in their own lives because it expands their understanding of the world and of other people. In some ways, I think of the Mandela plot as a goodbye letter, um, an epitaph to that early part of my life. Writing it was perhaps an attempt to make sense of those first 18 years and to put them to rest, to escape them. Of course, we can never fully escape our early selves. Those first years shape our personalities for the rest of our days, just as a country can never escape the gravity of its founding stories, uh, just as my grandmother could never escape Desat. Uh, just as the Helga family could not escape their own nemeses in the Oberholzers. When you are an immigrant to a new country, a new culture, you leave behind what you once were. And in the case of South Africa, the country that I once belonged to has simply ceased to exist. It was like crossing a bridge uh, that then got swept away by a flood behind you. The old South Africa died, rightfully so, and the new South Africa is a totally different nation. When I go back there now, I'm a stranger in a foreign land, even though I come from that place. I'm alienated from my former homeland, just as I'm alienated from my younger self. It's interesting that a similar process took place in Lithuania. If, if I think about it, if my, my grandmother could, could never have gone back to Lithuania because that Yiddish world ceased to exist, and she would have been as alienated from uh, Lithuania as I am from South Africa in a way. Um, that sense of estrangement is, is present in both of the books. Um, and also in, in the Mandela plot, we see Martin before the revolution and after, and there's a personal transformation that happens to him just as the country is transformed through the, the violence of revolution. I chose the title of the Mandela plot for a few reasons. It has the, it sort of sounds like a thriller, a thriller title, but it means much more than that to me. Uh, the aim of the novel as a whole was to read like a thriller on the surface, but have deeper levels that could be accessed with subsequent readings. The Mandela plot refers to um, a sort of a story, generically we could say a story that has a good and happy ending because Nelson Mandela's story is the plot of justice overcoming injustice, of evil transformed into good, hope overcoming despair. I'm sure you're all very familiar with, with, uh, with Nelson Mandela's life story. But the problem, of course, is that reality is never so clear. Um, therefore, the Mandela plot is ironical in a way. The title is, is almost cynical because the book shows how the same people who fought so hard to overturn the injustice of apartheid then became the very government that has been systematically looting the country in an orgy of corruption. So there is no happy ending to this 
Mandela plot. Um, apartheid was, of course, rightly thrown on the junk heap of history, but the new South Africa has failed to address the impoverished conditions of ordinary people, I would say, has in fact stolen from them while using Mandela's name as a cover. Um, the Lion Seeker, too, is a title rich in irony, because that which Isaac sought, the success he so desperately chased in a new country in order to secure his family's uh, permanent future was not real security at all and, and didn't turn out to be permanent. At the start of this talk, I spoke about emigration, of me being in the third generation of immigrants. And later I mentioned how immigration is portrayed uh, almost as a means of escaping the repetitive cycles of history. If there's one overarching feeling that permeates both books, it is this very Jewish sense of perpetual insecurity and the historical struggle to try to end it. One of the characters in The Lion Seeker is Isaac's sister, Rivoli. And I find it interesting that I ended up giving her the last word in the novel and not Isaac. Uh, Rivoli is a religious Zionist, and the answer to the question of home for her is obvious and solved. The final page of The Lion Seeker illustrates her perspective. It follows a scene in which Rivoli has just learned what happened exactly to the, all the Jews of Deset, where she was born. Um, she's sitting on a bench in Mount Carmel in Israel, reflecting on the massacre. And uh, I'm just going to read her thoughts at that time. Haifa Bay stretched wide its mute jaws of sky and water, the toothless eater of worlds, alive and dead. She had not ceased in the chanting of her words of prayer to try to sanctify the unholy. You do what you can. Bring light to dark. Lead a Jewish life in a Jewish country. For you, Mama, to be as strong as you were. Rivoli appears again near the end of the Mandela plot. She's much older, of course, and she's had uh, seven uh, sons. And she shows up when Martin is in an extremely fragile state. And she's determined to extricate him from South Africa and take him back with her to Israel, where she wants him to become a religious Zionist, um, as she is. But Martin has no interest in taking that course. For him, the United States is the only viable future. He wants to break free of the mire of the ethnic struggles in South Africa, and Israel seems to promise more of the same to him. But when the Mandela plot ends uh, with Martin, now in the United States, he, he receives a mysterious letter in New York from South Africa, which again takes hold of his consciousness and reminds him that whatever happened in the old country has followed him uh, to the new, just as it followed his grandparents from Lithuania to South Africa. The book's epigraph is a, a fictional one. Um, in other words, it's, it's attributed to an author that doesn't exist. It, that author's really me. Um, and, it, and it reads as follows. The story of a family or a nation is nothing but a succession of echoes. All human patterns repeat, only the style of each repetition may vary. And all that stands against us is the flimsy weapon of memory, as fragile as a web of dreams. Um, that brings this talk to a conclusion. Uh, thanks very much for, for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Please understand that this is going to be on UC television. And on UC television, we have to ask questions and speak into the mic so that you can become part of the vast network of the University of California stretching as far as Canada. Actually, there are people who in Canada. There are people watched, in Canada, yeah. yeah. No, I mean watch UC TV. So, so who would like to start? Who would like to start? Any questions or comments you want to make? Mitchell, did I? Are you? Do you want to ask a question? I, I, I need to get developed. Okay, <laughs> Mitchell's thinking. So, as Mitchell's thinking, would anyone else like to, to to ask a question or make a comment? What about the simile? Oh, and you're Dylan, right? No, sorry. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Sean. Thank you for the talk and for your time. Um, I would just like to ask if there's one lesson that you would like all of us to take from your books, what would it be? That's a very good question. I don't think I've ever been asked that before. Um, I don't think of fiction as didactic in that way. In other words, it's not designed to teach lessons. It's not that. I, I think of literature as a means of opening up questions and um, 
developing our, our way of thinking about about the world. So it, it, it's, it would be too simplistic to say that the lesson of the novel is X. I don't think there is a lesson other than then uh, to reflect some basic truths that I see in life, my subjective truths, and the reader can um, grapple with that in their own way and decide whether there's some insight worth learning. I think my books have, are quite harsh in many ways. The picture of the world that, that they paint is not um, a particularly attractive one, and so you'd, the reader would have to uh, struggle with that in their, own, in their own way and decide what that means for their life. Hope that helps. <laughs> with the microphone, who would like to ask another question? Any comments? Uh, Mitchell, go ahead. Pass this to Mitchell, please. Hello. Thank you. I was wondering. So, it it sounds like you really, of course, develop all of your characters in a in a very complete way. Have you ever? toyed with ideas of switching around the villains and the heroes within your stories and and what do you think about when you um, if you do play with that in your head um, I don't know um, I don't know that I set out to write heroes and villains as much as just to uh, to let the characters develop in, through the writing through the process of writing and uh, where they take me is is something that organically develops it's not it's not something that uh, I wouldn't uh, it's just the way I work I wouldn't schematically swap you know uh, characters around just to, I mean it sounds like an interesting exercise to do in a creative writing class but I I've never thought of approaching it that way I I don't um, I don't try to write villains or heroes and I don't think that the characters would think of themselves as as villains or heroes you know they're just sort of uh, but I do think that the books portray a, a world in which uh, it's very hard for people to be anything other than what their society uh, dictates. So, sure. Um, I know it's really difficult for somebody to pull up their roots and leave from a country and go to another country. Um, so could you say a little bit about what was happening with your family and what made them feel that they had to, to leave so desperately? Um, well, my family wasn't in, in desperate straits at all. But, uh, you know, we're, we were a comfortable middle class white family in South Africa. But um, my father was actually unusually... Um, I wouldn't call him a political man, but he he didn't uh, uh, he didn't he didn't like the apartheid system at all, the government, and you know he, he was a bit unusual in that we we didn't have a maid, for example, like most white families would automatically have a maid. We didn't have one. He preferred to do all the manual work himself, and he always wanted to leave. Um, but you know, there's a tension between the comfort of life and he, his uh, professional life and. Uh, wanting to start a new life over somewhere else. It took him a, lo a long time to, but the situation got so drastic. And I think also a big factor was that I was getting towards the age where I would have to go to the military at the end of high school, and he didn't want that. So it came to a sort of crisis point in the late 80s where the, situa the situation was clearly not tenable. Um, there were bombs going off and so on. That's all described in the novel. And uh, so he just uh, he was able to... Yeah, I mean, it didn't look like a, I, I, it didn't look like apartheid was going to go anywhere, in, anytime soon when we left. Like it was actually the height of, the height of uh, the anti-apartheid movement it was like '89 around there. So, I, I don't, I don't think my father saw and my mother either saw any future in the in the country for me. So uh, they made the move. That's that's really the story there. No, no. I, by the, the 1980s, uh, I experienced very little. Mind you, I should point out, like I lived in a, in a. I went to a Jewish school, and I lived in a neighborhood where all my the neighbors were Jewish. So I, I wasn't exposed to that much anti-Semitism. Although, if I stepped out of the comfort of that little community, it was there. But I wouldn't say that anti-Semitism was a major factor in South Africa. It's almost as if the 
the color issue, the race, the racial issue between uh, African people and European descent people was just so intense that it, there wasn't that much animosity left over for uh, towards Jewish people. At least that was my sense of it in the in the in the eighties. But back in the thirties, it was quite a serious issue for the Jewish community. But um, it wasn't a, a factor in our immigration. I wouldn't say. Hi, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming and speaking today. I really enjoyed it. Um, you touched a little bit about how um, the title of your of the second book, The Mandela Project, is a bit ironic. Um, could you like elaborate on like the current state in South Africa and where you see the country going? Okay, so South Africa has just elected recently a, a new uh, president and. Um, the, the, the prior president, Jacob Zuma, was a man very much associated with, uh, with incredible levels of corruption uh, and um, it was seen widely seen as disastrous for the country. Um, Raman Posa is supposed, supposedly turning a corner and, and uh, going to deal with corruption, but he's still surrounded by many of Zuma's uh, people, the same people that were close to Zuma. So I'm skeptical whether that the, the situation can change. And, I, and I'm worried that um, there'll be a, a move towards a more populist and angry politics because people are running out of patience if they haven't already and they, they want to see change in their lives that, that hasn't been delivered. Uh, and so I, I worry about that, that, that uh, a kind of, there is a, a populist figure on the horizon, um, Julius Malema, um, and it seemed like he could be a kind of Trump-like figure in the sense that he could uh, take over the, the party from within. And um, I'm, I'm just using the analogy of Trump because of the way he uh, appeared at the Republican convention and was able to sort of hijack the party from out of nowhere. He wasn't coming up the Republican ranks. In the same way, I think Malema could, could do something like that with the ANC and really be in power, and that would be a scary prospect, I think. I think you'd see... Um, you know, nationalizations of industry and so on, and I don't think it would be a good scene for the economy in, in the future, yeah. Other comments? Take this back to Sydney. Hi, thank you for coming today. Um, so actually, that was kind of like a good because I had a question about kind of like current politics. So kind of looking at the process of immigration through your personal experience, how do you perceive like the current process that's occurring in the political climate of today? How do I perceive the, the political climate in this country or? Well, just like in like through your experience of like immigration and how it's kind of changed over the courses, how do, how do, how do you perceive it as different or the same from what you experienced? Um, well, immigration is clearly now the, if not the, one of the major, if not the major issue, it seems, around the world. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very complex uh, subject. I, I mean, I'm not sure that I'd have to really give a lot of thought to it. I think that, for example, just, just off the top of my head, I mean, if I think about immigration, one of the things that's changed so much uh, is that in the in the olden days when people the olden days when people used to in the past when people emigrated they would leave their country behind in a very categorical way because there was no way to to keep in touch with uh, their former homelands today because of technology it's almost as if immigrant immigrant communities are so connected to their homelands that there's not that same level of assimilation perhaps. I don't know. I don't have data for any of that stuff, but that's just a, th a thought. So it means that the whole issue of immigration is, is, is much more thorny and problematic, perhaps, than it was in the past. Um, it's a very complex uh, uh, subject, a bit, a bit too broad for me to, to take on. Other uh, questions? I'm going to bring this around to you. Did you write in the genre of nonfiction 
or fiction to avoid the uh, controversiality of historical events in South Africa rather than uh, nonfiction? Um, no, I, I think of them as two completely different forms. I mean, to me, literature, a novel is a, a work of art that aims to be beyond a particular time and place. It's not ephemeral in, in the sense that a great novel should endure. I'm not saying that I've written a great one, but one aspires as a, as a writer of fiction to write a, a novel that could, uh, could endure way for, for, forever. And I think um, nonfiction is different in that way because it's tied to, I mean, it could be, there could be a great nonfiction writer who could write a, a great memoir, for example, that could also transcend its time and place. But I think what you're talking about um, would tie would mean nonfiction that is. Uh, it, it's I, I I don't really need to um, to write uh, a novel and and disguise my uh, to to disguise facts in fiction. I don't I don't really. It's not really part of the process of writing an art. It's a totally different. I'm not really articulating that that well, but um, just to some, I mean, novels are different to works of nonfiction. I, that's how I think of it. Like a nonfiction work needs to be uh, carefully, very careful with the facts and very careful about portraying things accurately. A novelist has the freedom to uh, manipulate events, time people with with the imagination and I don't think a novelist has any uh, duty other than to producing a great work of art and does is not really bound by facts uh, at all that's what fiction is fiction is the realm of the imagination um, well I'd like to say something um, I think you've pr presented a uh, Kenneth, an extraordinarily uh, moving presentation. And I think in several of the questions, the undercurrent has been immigration here and the situation we face. Um, and uh, so this is a very, very, I felt liberated that we could talk about it with you. And also, in part, one of the things that the Taubman uh, Symposia always tries to do is to provide us with views on the great diversity of the Jewish people, their history, the places they've lived, the cultures they've made, and most significantly, their interactions with the people around them. So you fulfilled, I, I think, the, the best goals of the Taubman Symposia this afternoon, and I'd like to thank you for coming from uh, Toronto, where it's so beautiful, and it's probably really hard to get you out <laughs> there in January oh, yeah. <laughs> to come to this it's so difficult here I, we're all dressed up with several layers of clothing and hand warmers gloves <laughs> it's difficult I know but well th thank you very much for having me I, yeah. I appreciate it okay please let me <laughs>